Thank you very much. And thanks for the organizers for the great event. Uh, so this is going to be a survey talk mostly, but uh, the ones that I'm co-authored with, they are with Eshaf, with what, which was my master's student at the time now, PhD student in Berkeley, Gotham, and then Chris, which is in uh, Google. Okay, let's just start. So we want to consider some uh, basic uh, uh, learning tasks where you want to learn with respect to a class of distributions uh, such as finite classes, Gaussians, their mixtures, and so on. So you are given an IID sample from a distribution from the class, you don't know it, and you want to estimate it. And we are interested in satisfying some requirements like good accuracy or utility, privacy, robustness, and computational efficiency, different cases. So let's be more specific. We have a learner A or estimator for the class. And the main requirement is that we want, so it receives some sample S uh, from the distribution IID, and it outputs a distribution as its estimate, A of S, and we want the total variation distance between F and A and S to be smaller than alpha. So alpha is the accuracy parameter that we are interested in, and we want this to happen with high probability. We fix the probability here to make the presentation simpler. All right. And what is the total variation distance? You can think of it as L1 distance between the density functions. So it's a very standard problem in statistics. And what are the requirements that we want to have uh, the privacy? Here we use epsilon delta dp. Sometimes we use epsilon, but the main focus is epsilon delta dp. Uh, it's good to have computational efficiency and uh, there's a lot of focus on sample efficiency what is the number of samples in terms of the accuracy parameter alpha and epsilon delta and the class that we need in order to get this accuracy alpha all right i didn't talk about robustness yet we sometimes also require robustness what do we mean by that uh, but before that Let's take a quick look to, uh, as a, as a, at a simple example of learning univariate Gaussians. You can simply use empirical mean and empirical, uh, empirical variance to estimate the distribution, but uh, you don't get privacy because it's too sensitive to outliers, but you get efficiency and sample efficiency, and it's order of one over alpha squared. All right, so this is simpler. Now, what about robustness? Here we assume that the actual distribution that is generating the data is from the class, but it's not a good assumption, especially for continuous domains. No distribution is actually a Gaussian. So instead of that, we relax that. We assume G is any distribution and it's generating the data, but we give us uh, ourselves some slack and uh, have a less demanding guarantee of error being smaller than alpha plus this term instead of just alpha. And C is just a constant, like 2, 3, 10. And opt is the best error that is possible with that class. What do we mean by that? Look at uh, uh, this picture. Uh, if you have the class F and you're distribution is outside the class you can compute the closest find the closest distribution in the class to that uh, distribution find the total variation distance call it opt so you want your error to be comparable with opt so c is kind of an important constant here all right and the classes of distributions that we look at are finite classes Gaussians and so on. And we'll see that even in these simple cases, there's still challenges for making them private. 
Okay, let's start with the simplest case, learning from only two distributions. In this case, you can use the Chef non-privately, you can use Chef A test. What does it do? If you have density F1 and F2, you can look at the set A, which is the set of all points where F1 is larger or equal to F2, call that set A. Without seeing any data, you can say 70%, uh, like the probability that F1 assigns to that, say, that set is 0.7. The probability that F2 assigns to that set uh, is 0.3, let's say. And now you get your sample, let's say you get five instances. Two of them, or 40%, are in the set A. So you get another empirical estimate of that set. Uh, probability of that set it's 40 so it's closer to 0.3 compared to 0.7 therefore you choose f2 the benefit of the chefet test is that it is robust in it has uh, a constant three times opt plus alpha guarantee now during this talk i focus a lot on these constants and you might say in some cs uh, uh, literature, they just say order of opt, but it's a very different thing, and it's, I think it's very important to keep these constants. And the reason is that, unlike these constants, uh, that say, for example, if the number of samples is order of one over alpha squared, then you get this guarantee. Here, the constants are less important because you get more samples, you fix the issue of the constants. But for the three opt constant, if you get more and more samples, it doesn't help. There is a misspecification in your model. So it matters whether it's three or 10. And it matters a lot. All right. How do we make it private? If you think about it, it's just a single counting query. How many points were in set A? So you can make it private. And uh, there is a Better version of the Chefe set that achieved two opt, which is optimal. And you can also make that private easily because if you think about it, it just randomly chooses between F1 and F2 based on a weight that, uh, like if it was very close to F1, F1's estimate it always picks F1, and then there is a probabilistic uh, choice. So you can make this also uh, probably. Uh, you can make it private. Okay, what about the case that we have more than uh, two uh, hypotheses? This case is called hypothesis selection, finite class. And non-privately, what you can do is that, you know, you can achieve this sample complexity of log of the size of the class over alpha squared. So this is enough for non-private. And how do we achieve it? There are different, the classic methods that have different constant C. So let's start with the tournament one. The idea is that you play a Chef a game between each pair of distributions. One of them wins. And then you look at all these pairs of games and count how many times each distribution won and uh, pick the one that won in most of the games. Uh, all right, so how do we make this one private? So there is a nice uh, paper by Bon Kamas Steinke Wu, private hypothesis selection that makes this private. So it's very useful because a lot of other uh, problems depend on the hypothesis selection as a building block. But one thing is that it doesn't achieve a good constant C so you can improve it, perhaps. Uh, so we also observe that if you just look at the other non-private estimator, MDE, automatically the score function that it uses, it's not sensitive. So you can directly use exponential mechanism, improve both the sample complexity a little bit and mostly the constant C. All right. There is a more recent uh, result for non-private case that achieves factor of two, and we don't know how to make it private. 
So that's one nice uh, question. Again, this is a very basic question and any improvement result in many subsequent improvement in other problems. All right, so let's now look at univariate Gaussians. You have uh, unbounded univariate Gaussians. You don't want to estimate mean and variance per se. You want to estimate the distribution in TV distance, right? That was the setting. So you cannot simply add Laplace noise because things are unbounded. So what do you do? Again, there is a nice work by Kara Wadan, Salil is here. So the idea is that we estimate sigma, then we estimate mu, and then we combine them together. Let's take a closer look because it's gonna be useful for us. So as a building block, it, use, uh, it uses stable histograms where uh, you can release uh, approximate values for an infinite, uh, a histogram with infinite number of bins. Okay, how do we use this uh, private stable histogram? For now, assume that you know the variance, you just uh, want to learn the mean. In this case, you divide the domain into bins whose width is around sigma or, uh, uh, or proportional to sigma, and then use the private histogram then you get, uh, then you look at the heaviest bin in the histogram. It gives you a sense of the center of the Gaussian. Then you can, once you have this sense, you, you can bound things and things become nice. But that's the main part of it. Important note is that you don't, uh, you actually need to know sigma. If you just pick any binning, it doesn't work. If it's too small, Nothing falls into those bins and they are all become zero. If it's too wide, you don't get good accuracy. So you need to know sigma for this to work. What about the case that uh, you know the other way around? The mean is zero, now you don't know sigma. In this case, you can use geometric binning. And similarly, pick the heaviest bin and it works. Again, it relies on the fact that the mean is zero. That's why you created the geometric binning centered at zero. It doesn't work uh, otherwise. Now, if you don't know either of them, it's a common uh, trick that you take the difference between two points, uh, samples in your data set, and then it becomes a zero mean, and then you find the variance, and then from that you find the mean. Okay, so that's very nice. And we were lucky because the difference of two Gaussians become, became a, uh, another Gaussian. And that's the additional sample cost of privacy. That part is just uh, for the non-private case. All right. And this can be implemented efficiently if, although it's infinite histogram, you can implement it uh, using lazy binning, only look at those bins that there are actually samples in them. But it's not robust because if your Gaussian is like this, you know, there's a hole in the middle and maybe there's a bump there, you might pick the heavy bin outside, uh, like uh, far away. Now you can make this probably you can make this uh, robust by not looking at just the heaviest bin, look at multiple bins or uh, something like that. But uh, someone has, has to do the computation and see what the best value of C we can get out of this approach. So that's a nice uh, question. All right, so that was about univariate Gaussian. Now let's go, oops, I'm going forward. Let's now talk about mixtures of univariate Gaussians. So again, the parameters mean and sigmas are unbounded and different for each component. 
the weight could be small or large for each component. And you, want, you don't want to learn the parameters. You want, you want to just learn the density. What do we do now? So um, we show that this is with somewhat similar or similar ideas to Karawadan, we can do this. We gave a reduction from least decodable learning of Gaussians on their, uh, like from least decodable learning of Gaussians on their Huber's noise to uh, basically if you solve this problem, then you solve the mixture problem. But there are two things that I want to uh, tell you is that it's not computationally efficient, unfortunately, and its sample complexity grows quadratically with K. And why is that? So first of all, it's important to, like it, it's a nice question to make it computationally efficient. Why? Because in non-private setting, we know that there are non-proper methods that are computationally efficient but in private setting, we don't know. The other thing is that the sample dependence is K squared. We expect this to be K in the non-private setting. K is the number of components. And the reason that it became K squared is that the centering trick that uh, was in Korowadon, that you take the difference of two Gaussians that became Gaussian doesn't work that well. You take the difference of two mixtures of K Gaussian becomes a mixture of K squared Gaussian. So how do you uh, avoid this barrier is an interesting question. Even non-efficient. All right. So now let's switch to high dimensional case, high dimensional learning of Gaussians. What does it mean to have a small total variation distance between two Gaussians? For the means, it means that the Mahalanobis distance should be small. For the covariances, this Frobenius norm or spectral norm has to be small. Now, the main challenge is really learning sigma, the covariance matrix, because learning the mean, once you know the covariance is uh, easy, you can uh, do it even one dimension by one dimension. And the challenge is that if you have an, an almost uh, degenerate Gaussian, like those two covariance matrices, then even you, if you make a little bit of mistake in understanding the, for example, the angle of the uh, covariance, mat uh, covariance matrix or eigenvectors, then you have a larger. So you cannot just add noise, isotropic noise, because it adds too much noise to some sensitive directions. All right, so there's been a lot of recent interest in this problem. Uh, the first one gave, which is a very useful approach, gave a method that depends on kappa, which is the condition number of the covariance matrix. So for the cases where it is not degenerate, it works very well, but the rest try to re uh, remove that uh, dependence. I'm going to briefly first talk about the second one. Second one is not efficient, but there is a nice question in it that we want to discuss. So it's not efficient. Again, this is based on an idea that were, was present in the private hypothesis selection paper. So it says that as long as you have a class of distributions that is locally small and it satisfies the second property, then you are good. The second property, we don't talk about it much because it's, it, it is there for non-private case too. So don't worry about it. But what is the first condition that is new to, uh, because of privacy? It says that if you have a cover for the set of all distributions in your class that is locally small, meaning that if you look at each distribution in the cover, there are not so many distributions around it. And all of these distances are TV distances, TV balls, TV distances. Then you are good. So what 
what, what we should do for Gaussians, high dimensional Gaussians, to show that there is a small, there is a cover that is locally small. All right, for 1D Gaussians, for example, with known sigma, it's easy. You just put all the, uh, like, create a grid for the means, and then it's locally small. And then they show that you can do some greetings, similar greetings for univariate and basically access aligned Gaussians, which is similar. But surprisingly, it's not easy to create a cover just by greeting for general Gaussians, or at least we couldn't come up with it. So we proved that existence of such cover using Zor's lemma, which is non-constructive, which uh, basically says there exists a maximal packing for a class, but we weren't able to, so it helps to prove the bound, uh, the sample complexity bound, but if, in order to turn it into actual algorithm, you need the cover, and uh, we don't have it. So it's a nice problem to create a locally a small cover for ga just Gaussians. And uh, I think this speaks to a broader issue that is the issue of first uh, presentation or representation of the a class of uh, hypotheses or distributions, and it depends uh, matters a lot. And technically, the issue is that you can create, you know, if you look at each locality, you can create a nice cover that works for that part, but you don't know how to glue them together to create a one cover that is locally small. All right. So what about the rest? This one, uh, Argiris talked about it briefly. This one uses sum of squares uh, method. And I'm going to briefly talk about these two, which achieve a better dependence and better sample complexity dependence. One of them is robust, one of them is non-robust. All right, but we want to step back and because a lot of complications is coming from learning the covariance metrics and the geometry of that. But we want to step back and see whether there is a more general idea or reduction from uh, private to non-private learning that can be useful beyond just learning Gaussians. Okay, let's see what we do. So here's a simple idea. Based on sample, subsample and aggregate, you divide your data set into parts, uh, disjoint parts. You run the non-private learner, whatever you have for the case of Gaussians, the learner for Gaussians that you have, the non-private one, and get one solution. So each of those blue points represent a non-private solution based on a subsample of data. Now, you check whether those uh, solutions are concentrated around each other or they're scattered around. If they're scattered around, even the non-private method didn't work, so it's okay to fail. But if most of them or majority of them are concentrated around each other, then you can go to the next step and you remove the outliers, compute a weighted average of things that are not removed, and then add noise to that weighted average. The critical uh, observation is that uh, Yes, so the weighting and removing outliers is based on counting, for example, for this, uh, for this one, one of the solutions, you can count how many other solutions are close to it based on some distance that comes from the problem. And then this counting kind of controls uh, the sensitivity. Weighted average, again, helps to reduce the sensitivity. All right, so technical, this is a general framework, but what about covariance estimation? So for covariance estimation, you can pick your distance to be this based on what we had for the problem. It's not a 
metric. It doesn't satisfy triangle inequality, but you can make it work. And for the noise, the last step of adding noise to the covariance matrix, we add this noise, which G is a Gaussian noise matrix, which if you think about it, when you do it this way, you don't add too much noise in directions that are, uh, you know, have a small eigenvalues. So it's, uh, it, preserves, it, it uh, preserves the accuracy, doesn't add too much noise, and it also makes uh, covariances that are close indistinguishable from each other. All right, so you can apply this idea for uh, different problems. For example, you can apply it to, for covariance estimation. You can apply it for just robust mean estimation or robust covariance estimation. And interestingly, you get good results in those uh, settings too. So what about mixtures of high dimensional Gaussians? Interestingly, um, sample complexity only uh, recently uh, like, uh, was proved and uh, we don't have any upper bounds for the private setting. So that's another nice question. All right, so the final thoughts. Uh, we saw that a lot of the times uh, the analyses that we have for robust case have large C. And sometimes they don't even say what is C. C is a very large constant. But if you think about it, if C is larger than 10, I would say, or like 40, 50, it makes the method almost useless in presence of uh, model misspecification. So it's very important to do that. One issue is that, you know, papers build on top of each other and you have a, some kind of issue similar to privacy in the sense that you get some constant 10 for this method. You use it as a subroutine in another method, the constant becomes 20. Now you use it in a subroutine and another method becomes 40. So it makes it larger and larger and eventually it's hard to even find the constant because you need to read a lot of papers. So we need some more formal way and nicer way to control this seed, some kind of composition uh, that can help us to do that. And uh, all of the ex examples that I know for the density estimation. If we know a solution, non, uh, or let me put it this way, I don't know any example where we don't know how to learn it privately, unless we don't know how to learn it non-privately. So we don't have any example that privacy makes things unlearnable. So is there any class that we can find? So, uh, important question. And based on the reduction that we have, I get the intuition that the answer is no, we cannot find, and there should be a general reduction from private to non-private learning for density estimation. Now, some of you may, uh, may say that for classification, this is not the case because learning threshold, for example, is the counter example, but I argue that this is a totally different problem. And the reason is that the metric, the total variation metric is fixed, bounded. Okay, bounded, the classification is also bounded. But it's fixed and you can actually compute the distance of two distributions without knowing anything about the data. You can compute TV distance. But for classification, they, if you're given two classifiers, you can't say how different they are unless you see the data because maybe uh, maybe they are different, but on the data, on that part of the data, they are actually very similar. So that's, that, that's what helped us to get the reduction. And I think that's a general idea and should be able to agree. Okay, that's it. Thank you.